is for your glory. That we come together at this hour to hear what is on your heart. And as one of your ambassadors, and I will dare say an ambassador of King Jesus, that I am here on his behest to communicate what's on his heart, that the church needs to hear. Let's hear what the Spirit is saying to the ecclesia. There's a reason why this particular message has been put together. There's a reason why this message has been birthed. It is not simply to fill up space. It is just not to occupy our time on a Sunday afternoon. There's a reason why God is speaking this particular message at this particular hour and why we must pay attention to what he is saying. We began last week talking about the fact that, the, that God is the God of covenants. He's the God of promises. He wants us to understand that he has laid a foundation. Jesus is that foundation. And he represents the eternal covenant, the new covenant. Last week we spent some time talking about the covenants. And we're going to continue to finish up here uh, on this. Of course, we'll never exhaust this subject. We will never exhaust this subject. But we'll do our best to finish up what we started last week. And we'll continue to build on that. Because the Father wants us to know we have legal rights to stand on the ground that we stand on. When they came to Jesus and they said, by what authority do you do this? Well, he kind of had to put them back on their heels a little bit. But the fact of the matter is, he had every legal right to be there doing what he was doing. He had every legal right behind him. As we said last week, every law in America founds its, has its authority based on the Constitution of the United States. What right, what right, Mr. Officer, do you have to pull me over and challenge my driving skills? Because the Constitution of the United States empowers the Constitution of Idaho, which gives me the right to pull you over. Because there are laws of right and wrong. And if we're in violation of one of those laws, he has every legal right to challenge us. We have legal rights to come before him and say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have a legal right to make that declaration because of the eternal covenant, the new covenant, and each one of the previous covenants we talked about last week, the Adenic, the Adamic, the Noahic, the Abrahamic, the Davidic, the Kadosh, the Eretz Kadosh, the Holy Land Covenant, the New Covenant, the Eternal Covenant. We have legal right. What right do you have to ask for healing? What right do you have to ask for blessings? What right do you have to ask for favor on your life? What right do you have to come into the presence of God and ask Him? for blessings and protection, for deliverance and for salvation. What right do you have? We have every right because we stand on the eternal covenant. We stand on the power of the new covenant that was purchased by the blood of Jesus. We have every right to call upon the 8,000 some promises that are in the Bible. We have every right to call upon those promises. 2 Corinthians 1, 20 through 21. For as many as are the promises of God in him, Jesus. All the promises that were made from Adam going all the way up 
through history that God made to the children of Israel, that he made to the disciples, that he made Paul, that he revealed through his scripture. Every one of those promises that were made, every single one of them in Jesus is yes. So God, God, uh, will, will you bless my life? Yes. Oh Lord, will you come into my heart and save me? Yes. Oh Lord, Father, will you give me favor? Yes. Father, will you bless my children? Yes. Lord, will you bless my life? Yes. Will you provide for my every need? His answer is yes. They're all yes in Jesus. And how do we respond to this amazing gift? Our response is amen. Amen. Truly, I agree with those promises that you have made to us in Jesus. He says yes to us. Our response is amen. Why? To his glory. Because when we come into agreement with his heart, with our heart, and the two come together, he is glorified when he sees us bearing fruit, when he sees us accomplishing what he always wanted to accomplish in us, and we start accomplishing it. We start walking in his favor. We start walking in his glory. Glory. We start seeing prayers answered. That is to his glory. It is to his glory to see his promises manifesting in us as we declare them back to him and he fulfills them. One of the reasons why this study began is because the father was wanting us to understand you need to pray like you've never prayed before. But you need to understand, we don't just pray randomly. We don't just sit there and have nice little prayer meetings where we talk about nice little prayers, which we hope might come to pass. Maybe God will do something. If my language is flowery enough, if I can pray my prayer with enough passion, if I can pray my prayer lead long enough, maybe he'll do something. Maybe I can move him by my attitude, by my determination, by my passion. He goes, that's not what moves me. What moves me is my covenantal agreement with you. I have extended my hand to you and said, will you come into agreement with me? Let us covenant with one another. I'm extending my covenantal authority to you. You come into agreement with that covenantal authority. And then he says, I will do what I said I will do. Call unto me and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. That is a fact. It is a covenantal commitment that he has made. It is not just a lovely prayer. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That is not just a Sunday school scripture. That is not just a little scripture that we quote because it's lyrical. It's a fact based on the covenantal agreement that he made through his son to us as he extended that authority to us. He says, I will give you eternal life. The Bible is absolutely filled with promises. And more than ever, ever I am now uh, on my phone highlighting specifically promises. Amen. There are promise after promise. And he's saying, when will my people take me seriously when I say to them, I have made a promise to you that I have begun a good work in you and I will fulfill it until the day of Jesus Christ. It is a fact. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. We don't just quote that because we're having a supernatural spiritual warfare conference and it sounds so, ah, oh, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. He says, I have made a covenant. And then that within that covenant is a commitment to do exactly what I have promised. And when I said to you, when I say to you, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I meant it. And what we have as a challenge in the body of Christ, we haven't taken him seriously. 
We have not taken him seriously. We do not understand that he has come into a covenantal relationship with us. We talked a little bit about the covenants last week, the Adenic covenant, which was the first covenant God made with Adam and Eve. And that covenant was broken. And because of it being broken, he then created a new covenant with Adam and then moved on to Noah and then to Abraham. Some of the most powerful promises are in the Abrahamic covenant. And, some, and then we go into the Mosaic covenant, which is fundamentally the old covenant or the previous covenant. And then we come into the Eretz, or the Holy Land. Eretz is the Hebrew word for land. The Holy Land, the covenantal land. He made a promise about that land. If you don't think Israel matters, believe me, it matters. The Lord made a covenant in regard to that land and that city called Jerusalem. And the Davidic covenant, the new covenant that was born, brought about through Jesus, and of course, there is the eternal covenant that always was and always will be. Some of these covenant covenants, like the Noahic covenant, he said, uh, I will never, ever flood the earth or destroy the earth and humanity by water. He made a covenantal promise and he put a rainbow in the skies to remind us and himself, because that's what he said, to be reminded of the fact that there is a covenantal promise. I will never destroy the earth by a flood again. But I don't know about fire. I don't know about fire. Maybe not water. But he made a promise. So let's go quickly through the Abrahamic covenant. And I want to do this for a couple reasons because I want you to catch something here. Listen to this language because you understand Abraham, he uh, showed, he showed, uh, uh, pre-showed something about the crucifixion. He did two ways of showing something about the crucifixion. What was the first one that, 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 that uh, was done to represent or to foreshadow the cross? What was the first one? Isaac. Oh, yes. He took Isaac, and, he t and Isaac was not sacrificed. His only begotten son was not sacrificed. He was foreshadowing the cross because there would be a day when God's only son, his begotten son, was Abraham's covenant. Let's go through this. Genesis 15, 19, 9 through 10. He said to them, bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and he cut them in two and laid each opposite the other. And God walked down the middle. Genesis 15, 17, it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between the two pieces. In between the two pieces, there was an oven. An oven or the furnace always represents persecution, tra tragedy, trauma, death. And it was very very dark. And then came a torch. Just when the furnace thought it was going to have its day, came a torch of light between the two. Genesis 15, 17. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, listen now, he is coming into a covenantal relationship. Do you understand the power of that? You know when he says here, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the river, the great river Euphrates. You know what he was saying? From the river to the sea belongs to me, is what God was saying. From the river to the sea belongs to me. Abraham, I will give it to you. But you see here in the midst of this, Abraham was also being challenged with the with the key word of the covenants. Remember what last week we talked, what is the key word of the covenants? The key word was if. It all depends on if. If you will, I will. If you will, I will. It's the power behind the covenant. He, God has extended his hand, so to speak. We have to take his hand and come into covenantal relationship. And the most wonderful way that we demonstrate our covenantal relationship with God is by 
coming to the communion table where we come into common union with him and we validate the covenant he's extended to us. So these are now the words of the covenant. This is the, I will give your descendants all the lands and in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. How's that covenant? What's he speaking of? He's talking about Jesus. I am going to give you one of your descendants that will be a blessing to all the earth. After Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. These are the words of the covenant. The covenant has language in it. So that we understand. I understand my part. I understand your part. Father says, I will if you will. I will if you will. Romans 4, 20 through 22, it says, but he, that is Abraham, listen to this. He did not waver at the promise of God. Why did he not waver at the promise of God? Because the promise was built upon a covenantal agreement. There is no doubt. I, I, I could tell somebody, uh, listen, I, I'll, I'll sell you my car here, you know, for X amount of dollars. Uh, would you agree? Sure, I agree. I like that. Then you show up to buy the car at that, that dollar amount, and then the person says, well, you know, between then and now, I decided I'm going to charge you another $10,000. But that's not what you said. Oh, said? You mean it's not in writing? We don't have a formal agreement? Then I can change it anytime I want. But when you have a formal, why do you do contracts? You do them so that everybody understands what the obligations are. So there's no mystery. I will, if you will, I will do it at this time for this dollar amount, and it's in writing. Abraham did not waver in his faith because he had a contract in his hand. He had a covenant, a covenantal relationship that he had entered into God that gave power to those promises. At the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, what was the greatest power behind them? Where was his faith coming from? Because I have an agreement. I'm in contra I am in a covenantal relationship. We often talk about uh, marriage and certain things that uh, I know Cheryl will do and Cheryl knows I will do because we're in covenantal relationship. Because I told her she comes first before anything else. And that's why when I'm sitting here and I'm deep in thought and I'm deep in the middle of the thing that I was going to do and I'm caught up and I'm focused and she says, can you get up and go get me some bottles of water? What is my responsibility? Get up and go get the water. Why? Because her need is greater than my personal circumstance or situation because I made a commitment, agreement. It, Early on, I told her when it comes to sports, I love NFL, I love college football, college basketball, and, and I just happened to have a baseball game on early in our marriage, probably within months. And she knew how much I love sports. And I'm not that I'm a big baseball fan, but it was the World Series. And so she came out and she goes, if I asked you to turn off the World Series on the last game of the World Series to determine the national champion, would you turn off the TV? I reached over and picked up the clicker, turned the TV off without question. Because we're in a covenantal relationship that says she and her needs are more important than mine. If she says turn off the TV because I need you to turn off the TV, then the TV goes off. There's no doubt. That is a covenantal relationship that says your needs are higher than my needs. Well, she was shocked. This is what he does. This is how... <laughs> How he gets around it is he's gotten me interested in the sports, and so now we're watching it together. <laughs> so asking him to turn it off. <laughs> so you don't ask him. But, but the good thing is she was shocked. She was shocked that I would do that. And she immediately said, oh, no, you can turn it back on again. Just a test. That's just a test. And, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but every single covenant and every promise has a probation period. There's a probation period 
associated with every covenant and with every promise to see if we will do what we're called to do. It's the Father saying, will you turn off that TV program for me? Will you trust me when it takes six months to get the manifestation of that promise? Will you stay faithful? There's a probation period that goes with promises. But he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. He was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Why? Because he believed him. He was fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. If God says to you, I will do this, I will do that, I am making you a promise. I am convinced he can fulfill his promise and will not waver in unbelief. Even if it takes a year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, though it tarry, wait for it. Because it's coming. No matter how long it takes, it's coming. He did not waver in unbelief. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 32, Behold, days are coming. This is what God was telling Jeremiah some, what, 600 years? Uh, probably more like, yeah, about 600 years, 500 years before Jesus. Jeremiah, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with your fathers, Moses and others, in the day I took them out of out by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. I was a husband to them. And they didn't want me as a husband. A new covenant I'm going to make. Let's look at the new covenant. Number one, every covenant has the blood of the covenant. There's a sacrifice to be done. What is the blood of the new covenant? It was Jesus' own blood. He shed his blood. It was the blood of the new covenant. What is the altar of the covenant? The cross became the altar. Who's the mediator of the covenant? Every one of these covenants has an altar, uh, has a mediator. The mediator of the covenant, Jesus himself, our high priest. He was the mediator of this covenant between us and and his father. The sanctuary of the covenant is actually the heavenly temple because what did he do with the blood? He had to go take that blood into the heavenly temple and put it on the mercy seat. What Moses created was a model or, or a, a reflection of the true and only heavenly covenant. The new covenant has these components, but here's the other thing. The covenant was always cut. We cut the covenant. The sacrifice had to be cut. So look at this. The covenant was cut by a Roman spear. The covenant had to be cut, and it was cut by a Roman spear. Have you ever wondered about that? Here he is. He's crucified. He's nailed. He's died. He's dead. Why is a Roman soldier going up and poking his side with a spear? Because the covenant had to be cut. And look at this. He was put between two criminals. The Abrahamic covenant was representative of this. It had to be cut in half, and they slayed side by side. And down through the middle went the fiery furnace of suffering. And that's Jesus. But not only was that the fiery furnace, the cross was the furnace of affliction, but it was also the torch that was raised up as a light for the nations to rally around. So what are the words of the covenant? We could go on and on. We could spend months talking about the, the words of the covenant. So we're just going to grab a couple of them here. These are the words of the covenant. In other words, this is the commitment that God is making to us. He's making this commitment first. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is a promise. 
And that promise, the authority behind that promise is the new covenant that was made through Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Amen. Yes, ma'am. That demonstration that you just said, when David made the sacrifice, that he was offered, he says, I cannot give that which costs me nothing. It's because God said, I cannot give that which costs me nothing. It costs him everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. The words of the covenant. So again, like I said, we could go on and on and on about the words of the covenant. Here's another one. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And here's the promise. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Truly. Amen. He's made a commitment to us. The power of the promises in the scriptures. And uh, I know there's a lot of books uh, uh, filled with promises, uh, but I, I have this, this here, this particular list of promises is very, very precious to me. And the reason why these scriptures are so pro precious to me is because after I became a believer in Jesus, um, I was living in Italy, and uh, I went back to Italy, went back to Naples, and when I came back as a believer, as some of you have heard my testimony, but as I came back as a believer, uh, I was managing, I was out of the Navy now, and I was managing a, a night cafeteria, and all my employees were Italian, half spoke English, half didn't, and uh, one, when I came back, one of my employees, Armando, uh, Armando comes up to me, and he goes, he looks at me, I'm, I'm a Christian now, he looks at me like this, he goes, so, what happened? I look at Armando, I says, what, what, do you, what, what's the problem, what do you mean? He goes, no, what happened? I said, Armando, what are you talking about? He says, listen, before you leave your face, she's a dead. You come back, it's alive. What happened? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was in a prayer meeting shortly thereafter. I was in a prayer meeting, and I didn't know what prayer meetings were, but a bunch of people said, we're going to pray. Okay, uh, I'm a new Christian. I don't know. We get together, and there's a man there that was a very senior to me, uh, several very high, much higher rank than me, uh, a chief petty officer. He's staring at me, and I'm like going, Dude, you're creeping me out here now because he's staring at me. I'm like, what's your problem? And he goes, you, you have a very special call on your life. And I'm like, okay, whatever that means. I didn't know what to make of this guy. He comes back just a little while later. I, I can show you the handwritten notes, but every one of those promises he hand wrote every single promise, and I have those notes still. He hand wrote every single promise. He handed it to me, and he says, you have a very special call of God on your life. What is empowering the promises is that he is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping, covenant-empowering God who has made promises to us and what he's really wanting us to understand. You can stand on those promises and look at those promises in ways we've not looked at them before. We've looked at them in ways of just, oh, you know, things are going kind of rough, you know, oh, let's, uh, let's, let's go find a promise, okay? You know, and it's like, I sure hope that works. You know, it'd really be nice, God. I know if you don't do it, it's okay, you know, but it would be nice. But God is saying, you don't understand. I have made promises to you. And I shed blood to validate that covenant. And you're sitting there doubting whether I can do what I promised to do. I said, I will always be with you to the end of the age. How is he with us today? He's with us through the gift of the Holy Spirit who sealed that covenant. Because there is a seal to the covenant. There is a seal. There's a sign and there is a token with every covenant. There is a seal of the covenant. Now, isn't it curious? I want to, before I do this, I, 
isn't it curious to me? It's curious to me that some people who have bought into the heresy of cessationist doctrine, the cessationist doctrine, which is heresy, it really is, to deny the Holy Spirit access because someone said he doesn't work like that anymore. There are no apostles. There are no healing. There are no miracles. There is no speaking in tongues. None of, that's called cessationist doctrine. That's a heresy because it's not true. So why if in salvation we're given the Holy Spirit and therefore that's all you need, you got all that you want, when you said yes to Jesus, Holy Spirit came in, which I agree he does because you're born again. I'm not arguing with that. But why in the world would he put in Luke 11, 11 through 13? Luke 11, 11 through 13. Why would he put this scripture in the Bible? If the Holy Spirit in fullness is given at the time of salvation, then why is this verse in the Bible? How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So if I got the Holy Spirit through salvation, then why is this scripture in there? Why would I need, that scripture is superfluous. Because if I got saved and got the Holy Spirit, which you do, in measure, then why would he put in the scriptures, Luke 11, 11 through 13? He will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. What is the seal of the covenant? The seal of the covenant is salvation. It's being born again. Hallelujah. That is glorious. And there's a lot of uh, individuals out there that have the Holy Spirit that they gained through salvation when they became born again. But what is the sign of the covenant? The sign of the covenant is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is the sign. Something happened in me. When the Holy Spirit came in in fullness, he was the seal of what happened. I was born again. I was born again. And I can honestly say I was born again. And it was radical. And did the Holy Spirit come in to the degree that he did to give me a new life, that born again experience? Absolutely. Did I, knew, did I know my sins were forgiven? Absolutely I knew. But over the period, over the time, from the time of my salvation, I began to become drier and drier and drier. And I read the Bible like, but it lost the life. And I was confused. How could I go from this incredible salvation experience into now? And then to have people kind of come up to you and say, well, get in line, because it's just the way it is. You just go to church, you don't ask questions, you sit and you listen, and you pay your tithes, and you sing some songs, and you tell people about Jesus, and you're good. That's it. That's it. You've arrived. That's it. And, and you don't question. You don't question. But, but, but I, don't, I don't feel what I... It's not about feelings. You don't need feelings. All of that business when you got born again and got so crazy and bouncing off the wall and you wanted everybody to know about Jesus, that'll all go away when you calm down, become more mature. So here I am now kind of like going, try, trying to fit in, but for some reason the way God has made me is I don't fit in. I just don't fit in. I ask too many questions and I'm not satisfied with just a little bit when I want everything. It's just my makeup. What can I say? I'm a perfect member of the misfit arm. <laughs> very, very much. And then there came this day. See, in a way, and, and again, I know that keep the cards and letters coming out. Oh, this is this message is going to thrill everybody. But in a way, in one sense, God said, when I got born again, He said. I want to come into a permanent relationship with you. That's exactly right. And we were engaged. We were engaged. Engagement is wonderful. I love the engagement period. And it sort of. It wasn't a mood ring. It was not a mood ring. Cheryl got a mood ring. The first engagement. Because the first request. Because I didn't say yes. I said maybe. <laughs> so she got a mood ring. But I'm telling you something. I was engaged. Which is exciting, but the Lord says, 
there's a marriage coming. And I got introduced to the Holy Spirit. And I went from engaged to married. And the Holy Spirit came in with that incredible power. And I picked up the Bible and I was like, <gasps> I couldn't believe what was in front of me. I was like, I didn't know that was in there. I didn't know it was in there. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I'm like, <gasps> the whole book came alive. I went from engaged to married. I was in a relationship that was eternal, not just an engagement. That's right. But I'm telling you something, something changed. If I may say this, being engaged to Cheryl was a thrill. And that's why he said yes. But being married to her changed everything. Then there was the token of the covenant. Now, on the wedding day, not only did I have an engagement, not only am I wedding, uh, gone through the wedding, but now I have a token. And everybody can see that token. That's the gift of tongues. Blessed are you. I was given a token, unmistakable. I can tell people, you can go up to somebody and say, I'm engaged, okay? Oh, you can go up to somebody and say, I'm married now, okay? Where's the token? What's the token? What do you have that, you, that validates what you just described? I can show you what I've got. He gave me a gift. That gift is a language that is a romantic worship language that only he understands. Sila. <laughs> <laughs> what does the Holy Spirit do? He leads us into all truth. First, First Corinthians 11, 24 through 25. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Covenant is serious. There are obligations on both sides. I will if you will. There are obligations. Are we living up to our end of the bargain? Are we living up to our part of the covenant? Are we taking it seriously? Or do we carry Jesus and our, sal and our salvation like an iPhone in your hip pocket? So when I get in trouble, I can pull out my iPhone and give Jesus a phone call. But other than that, it goes back in my hip pocket. I live life any way I want to live life. I do what I do when I feel like doing it. I meet the challenges, the obstacles, the problems on my own terms until I run out of my own terms. And then I reach for my back pocket and grab my iPhone out, which is my remembering. Oh, Jesus, we have a covenantal relationship. Can I call you now because I need some help? He is not a rabbit's foot. And, and promises, this promises are not answered because by magic. Promises in the Bible are not a magic wand right. to solve our problems. Right. It happens because the answer to our promise, the answer to our prayers happened because he put, he made a covenantal relationship. He made a covenantal promise to us. And based on that covenant, he made these promises. And if I do my part, he'll do his part. We are in a covenant and that's where the power of the answered prayers come from. I said earlier, every promise, every prophetic word has a probation period. And that is where people have a real challenge. Because I prayed, I prayed and I asked God to meet my needs yesterday. And my needs are still not met. So God doesn't answer prayer. There is a, there is a probate. What will you do? Will you fulfill your part of the bargain? Will you continue to have faith? Will you trust that what he said is true and not give up? 
just because we don't see that manifestation instantly. In Psalms 105, 19, it says, until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. And that test is to find out whether you're going to give up or not. Are you going to hold on to your faith? If he said, I will send forth my word and I will heal them. My word will not return to me void or empty without accomplishing the purpose for which I send it. We're not just reading these scriptures, like I said, we're in Sunday school, hoping against hope, and maybe even not even believing them, just quoting them because it feels lyrical. It just feels so good to say that scripture. It still feels so good to say that promise. But do I believe that promise is going to come to pass? I believe this is the call of the Holy Spirit. When I said earlier, hear what the Spirit is saying to the ecclesia. When I give a word, it will be accomplished because I have made a covenantal commitment to you to fulfill my word. The biggest challenge in the body of Christ today is we don't believe him. We're not stepping, and if we, if, if we do have belief, the other thing is we're not really stepping out on those promises as if they were true. I think of that scene back in the day, uh, Indiana Jones, uh, The Last Crusade. I don't know if you ever saw that movie, but there was a scene there where he was looking at a gulf. He looked at a valley, and, and the word was, you need to step. And he's, go he's looking, and he's going, Step where? There, there's nowhere to step. It's just a, this huge valley. And then he, he just kind of goes, ah! and then to his surprise, there was a bridge. But he didn't see that bridge. It wasn't until he actually stepped that the bridge manifested. God's calling us to jump and trust him. Habakkuk 2.3, for the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal. It will not fail. Would this be a promise? Though it tarries, wait for it. For it certainly, it will certainly come. It will not delay. I don't know about you all, but this, this teaching is wrecking me on the inside. <laughs> it's wrecking me. Because it's like, you mean actually trust. I mean, actually trust that what he said is true. And then realizing how little or how little time I've spent actually doing that. To actually step out when he says, you lay hands upon the sick and they will recover. Not maybe. They will recover. That is a promise based upon a covenantal commitment. I have made a covenant with you. And these are the words of the covenant. And these are the promises of the covenant. Something's got to happen inside to where we begin to believe what he says is true. And I'm telling you, folks, it's risky business. It's risky business. And that's probably why most of us just don't do that. For one thing, we're afraid. We're afraid that it might not be true. We're afraid that he might do it for others, but not for me. We're afraid that his reputation will be tarnished because he can't fulfill his promise like I said he would. So I'm afraid. So what we do, what we do with all the promises Forget about it. Let's just stay happy, happy, and teach anything but this. Because as soon as I pull this out and say, you have made me promises, God, I believe you. And I'm going to step out of the boat and walk on the water. Because you, you're doing it. If you're doing it, I can do it. But there's the challenge. It's a scary thing to get out of that boat mm -hmm. and start walking on that water. But if he looks at you and he says, come, come here. Sure. We're being given a challenge. Trust me, over the last five weeks of preparing this message, I've been challenged. <laughs> I've been challenged. 
Because the father says there, there's two things, two sides of this, and thank God for it. One is we do need to begin to practice before we teach. We can't just teach out of optimism. There's got to be a point where it's got to be real in our own lives. We've got to prove it at home right. before we export it outside the house. Yeah. So we have been working on that. I've been working on that. I'm not perfect yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, I press forward to the high calling of Christ Jesus. Knowing that I'm not perfect yet, but I'll keep pressing ahead. So what do I need? What do we need? Well, we need we have our need on one side, God's provisions on the other side. How are we going to get there? Philippians 4, 19 through 20. For God will supply all your needs. I need more faith. I need more confidence. I need more strength. I need more, I need, I need help to, to fulfill this word. I, I need help. My God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our need, God's provision, the basis is a promise. The promise is made based on covenant, and between and the covenant is revealed through the logos, the written word, rhema, the inspired word, and the two come together, and we have a bridge to get from our need to God's provision. The fact of the matter is, we have got to hear God's word. First of all, we got to hear the word. We got to know what those promises are. Here are the pro what is the promise that I need right now? Is it for more wisdom? Do I need more wisdom? Then I need a word about wisdom. Do I need physical healing? I need a word about physical healing. Do I need finances? I need a word about fi uh, finances. What is my need? I need to hear the word, receive that word. Okay, I receive it. I, I, I receive it. I, I make a decision. Yes, Lord, I receive it. You're giving me a gift. I receive it. I believe that word. I not only receive it, I believe it. Have you ever counseled someone and heard them say, I hear you? Have you ever counseled somebody and you say, I hear you. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, They hear you, but they don't believe you. And they're not receiving it. But I not only do I hear that word, I receive the word and I believe it. And more than, and, and then in addition to not only believing it, I trust you. I trust you, Lord. If you're making this promise to me, and I know that you are, based on covenantal commitment that you have made between you and I, and I have entered into that covenant with you every time I take that bread and I take that juice, we are in covenantal relationship. I trust you, Lord. I haven't seen it yet. I have not seen the manifestation yet, but I trust you. And that, and I have I rest in that hope. I'm waiting in rest and peace because I know you're going to do it. You're going to do it. And that does produce that faith that says, not only try hope and rest, but I have faith. Faith is rising up inside of me. This mountain is going to move. This mountain is going to move. I don't care how big that mountain is. It's going to move. And then we act as directed. Okay, now what do you want me to do? What do I need to do? It, and it's not even so much asking, well, what do I need to do? It's by living by faith. You know what to do. Yes, sir. You act as you are directed. And then you see the results or the effect. And that's why our favorite scripture is Philemon 1, 4. I pray that your faith will become effective through the knowledge of every good thing that is inside you. And I don't know about y'all, but I know what's good inside of me. Jesus is good inside of me. And he can accomplish anything. Hallelujah. So we pray, we're going to learn to pray the promises. What is it you need? Mental health, psychological health, spiritual health, physical health, financial health. What is it that you need? learning to pray those promises, but saying, Lord, help me understand the power behind this promise and the authority I have to pray this prayer to you and declare what I'm declaring. Amen. Help me understand what that means so that my prayers will become effective. 
and we'll see the results if there was ever a time, and I believe we're coming into a time even more than ever, where we have got to have results mm -hmm. to meet the challenges that are in front of us. And that will be a profound testimony to not only say our God can provide for us, because I have, David said, I have never seen God's people going hungry. I've never seen it. Our God will provide what we need. We need that kind of faith in this hour, in this season. So something's got to change inside of us. Now, I'm working on it. Help me understand, Lord, the absolute authority to stand on your covenantal promise, your covenantal commitment that validates the promises to pray the prayers that I'm praying. Isaiah 41.10 we're kind of on that new covenant foundation. Fear not, I am with you. Fear not, I am with you. This would be a promise. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That is a powerful Commitment. That's a promise. And, and I'm only speaking for myself, but I got to tell you, for most of my journey with the Lord, I have not had this depth of conviction. I have not had this depth. And I got to be honest, I think a lot of my prayers were prayers of, I certainly hope God will do something. But if He doesn't, that's okay. I'm beginning, I'm going to learn how to trust. You said, based on your covenantal commitment, you're with me. I will not be dismayed because you're my God. You will strengthen me. You will help me. And you will uphold, my right, uphold me with your righteous right hand. We are building on a solid foundation, Jesus Christ, the word of God, his covenant book, and his book of promises. They say over 8,000 promises are in that book. We're going to stand on all of them. Amen?